Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Creating a Safe Living Environment, uh, Safety Adaptations for People with Dementia. We appreciate all of you being here. These uh, complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration with our partners that you see there on the screen, O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, and Alzheimer's Orange County. And my name is Kim Bailey, and I'm with Alzheimer's Orange County. And it's my pleasure to be your host today. Uh, our sponsors provide this webinar as a service to the community. And we try to have topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults. And although a lot of our attendees are professionals, we also welcome our family caregivers, particularly today, because this topic is sure to be helpful to them as well. Um, so we have a wonderful speaker with us today, and I'm going to introduce her to you in just a few minutes. Um, her name is Leslie Ann Gabola. Uh, but before I tell you all about her, to just go over all of the nuts and bolts um, that are, is so important to those of you who are obtaining uh, continuing education credit. Leslie is a licensed occupational therapist with over 30 years of professional experience as an OT uh, in hospital settings and as a retailer of home medical supplies and adaptive equipment. Um, I've actually shopped at her store and bought things there, and it's an amazing um, business, and they have everything. I have to cough. Please excuse me. <coughs> I hope that wasn't too bad on everyone's ears. Um, Ms. Gabola is a partner in grant programs for Age Well, Change a Life Foundation, and St. Jude Caregiver Resource Center, as well as the Council on Aging. She's a member of the Laguna Hills and Costa Mesa Chambers of Commerce, a board member of Age Well Senior Services and Kiwanis, and an educator at Stanbridge uh, College. Um, doing Down With, oh, I'm sorry. Also, she is an educator with Down With Falls Coalition, and she's a certified equipment trainer for home health companies. So she's coming to us with a great deal of expertise, and of course, she's anxious to share all of that. So I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful speaker, Leslie Ann Gabola. Thank you, Kim. Hi, guys. Okay, so let's go through some general considerations when dealing with people with memory loss. Um, first of all is safety, and safety is a consideration in everything that we do. And consider the person with memory loss may have some impulsivity and that they may lack the ability to consider the consequences of their actions because of a lack of foresight. This makes supervision important, especially in later stages of the disease. And if you can give choices to at most when possible so they feel like they're involved and they can create an opportunity for involvement that will lead to, a, to success. If they participate in an activity, they, be more, they may be more cooperative and ultimately gain a sense of accomplishment and pride. What may work in the beginning stages may not work later stages. Remember to be aware of changes in cognition and processing. And also just be sure, and I'm gonna say this probably a lot, but kind of put yourself in their shoes and kind of ask how would you feel in that situation. So let's look at safety. And um, safety is of utmost importance, of course, for everything that we do, because that's we want to keep our clients safe. Um, and assistive devices can be helpful initially. And actually, if they're introduced early on in the stages or early on in the disease process, they become, you gain motor memory. So they become part of the person and they become more comfortable with them. Instead of trying to teach them later on and 
later stages, it's going to be easier to, if they need a cane, a crutch, a walker, um, anything like that, it's going to be easier to introduce it in the beginning stages. Teach them how to use it. And what I am just always adamant about is have it adjusted properly. And I'm going to go into this just a little bit here just because it says assistive devices but basically for all of you just to let you know when you're using a cane use it on the strong side and this helps support the weak side because the strong arm comes forward at the same time as the weak leg and so you get a nice balance there and it's just a normal walking pattern it's not, not something that they have to learn in fact the less you think about it the more it works so cane on the strong side adjusted properly and how you adjust a cane is you um, you can either cut it to the proper height if it's a wood cane but a lot of them are adjustable and the handle when the person is standing with their hands at their side the handle goes up to their wrist and so that is a proper height in general I mean there are exceptions to every rule but that's the comfortable proper height now with a walker, you see people with a walker raised practically up to their armpits, and that is so uncomfortable. I hear all the time, I need it higher, I need it higher, I need to stand up straight. That's not how you do it. Raise the walker only to about their hip bone. I say mid-hip, and hip bone is probably a good guideline. And then encourage the person to walk in the walker and if you try this sometime if you have a walker or if you come to my store we can go through this it will automatically make you stand up straight and the, the thing about it is is with improperly adjusted equipment it causes pain and it causes um, instability and unevenness of gait it just has a whole myriad of problems associated with it so you want your equipment adjusted properly, um, and we're adamant about that at the store. If somebody comes in with something improperly adjusted, we'll do it without even basically saying anything because it's so important. So move slowly, and um, we have a word in the Down With Falls Coalition. It's called deliberate. And so if you think about deliberate, what deliberate means, it means consciously, slowly, um, being in the moment, thinking about what you're doing, all those things. So if you associate the word deliberate with how you're approaching people in general, but especially pe people with memory loss, um, you'll be on the right track. Um, speak softly and step-by-step um, and -step instructions. So something like, okay, let's go to this, let's go, it's time for breakfast. You got to get up, you got to go, and I want you to go over and then sit in the red chair, and then we're going to have Cheerios, bananas, and milk. Way too much information. So softly, step by step. Okay, hi, it's time for breakfast. And wait for them to acknowledge, eye contact, look at you, and then move on with your instructions. Wait for that processing to happen. With somebody with um, memory loss, the verbal processing is going to be disturbed. It's going to be slower, and it's going to take them a minute to really put together what you're saying. Um, later on stages, verbal processing is an issue, and so gestures, touch, um, motions, things like that, and then routine that you have established in the earlier stages with muscle memory will come into play at that time. Always take the same route. So go from the, the living room to the kitchen, the same route. Again, you're establishing that muscle memory for later on stages. And I can't really stress that enough because the consistency may seem boring and you might want to change it up. But for somebody with memory loss, it's super, super important. And make sure also paths are clear. We usually say about three feet of space, especially if there's an assistive device present. Okay, so here's the big thing with me, comfort. Um, and the biggest indicator of comfort is you. So um, you have to consider comfort um, and consider your pet peeves. So, for instance, look at clothing. 
I know that I have a huge thing with tags. I cannot have tags. They make me crazy. So also tight clothes or clothes that are not soft. And so think about that. Think about your pet peeves. Some people don't like their hair down. Some people like their hair up. Some people are fastidious about their makeup. All of those things matter. And just because the person has a memory loss does not mean they're not still important to them. Remember, they may not recognize you, they may not realize your relationship, but they will always remember how you made them feel. And I'm probably gonna say that again because I think it's really important on down the line. So anyway, look at clothing. Is it too tight? Is it wrinkled? Um, wrinkles, if you're in a wheelchair or you're sitting in a chair and you're sitting there for a long time and maybe not moving as much as you should be, a wrinkle can turn into a bed sore of sorts, um, an, an ulcer, if it's first too long. Now, not that anybody's going to be that long in a chair in one spot, but you get the point. It could be a red mark that's uncomfortable. Also consider modesty. Um, especially in the older generation, modesty is key. So you have to consider modesty. Consider lighting, mood, smells, and sounds. Now lighting is critical because older people may have macular degeneration. And, um, but again, they may not be able to tell you that they can't see something or something is unclear or they see floaters. Um, if you, if you see squinting or maybe they're moving their head when they're trying to watch TV, perhaps they're trying to go around a blind spot. So be aware of that. Smells are critical too. And smells are an interesting thing because you can alert a person or you can calm a person down. So use that to your advantage. Things like chamomile, lavender, vanilla, those are all calming scents. Um, wintergreen, spearmint, those are, um, are arousing scents. So um, use those to your advantage. You can do um, like little infusers, you can do a hidden vaporizer, things like that. Also sounds. Be aware of sounds as loud sounds may be scary. Okay, so Bathing is another issue that is, is always an issue and it comes, it, it is an issue because it has so many factors. You can be cold, you can be, um, it's a time of modesty is important. So modesty is key when bathing. Uh, provide extra warm towels to keep the person covered and you can bathe one extremity at a time while keeping other parts covered. Maintain, maintain eye contact, which is critical in all your interaction for comfort reasons and reassure clients as needed. Generally, the room needs to be too warm for you to be comfortable to them because they're gonna be bare and wet and, and cold. Also soft lighting, as I mentioned earlier, lavender scents and music can facilitate a calm environment. The idea is that you wanna make the person feel as secure as, as possible. And we'll address this subject in more detail in a few moments. Now let's look at each room because each room has an issue and there can be hazards and uh, perceptual difficulties in each room of the home. Being aware of your specific client's needs and limitations can make caring much more, can make, limitations can make more successful for both of you. Remember, there are some basic perceptual difficulties that are pretty universal as stages progress. And these are things to keep in mind. Visually unable to discern boundaries, edges, and corners. And this can lead to a misinterpretation of what is seen. For example, dark rugs become holes, shiny floors appear wet, and shadows can be appear to be a stranger in a room. In addition, hallucinations may be present. Avoid constant correction instead of gently validate what they are seeing. You can use moderate contrast of colors and textures to highlight what you want them to see. And I would kind of stress the value of moderate because again, like we know, something with a dark contrast may be considered a hole. 
Okay, so let's look at the, the living room. And the living room or the entry is often where we find a throw rug. And I automatically kind of, I'll always ask when I'm doing home safety evaluations if I can pick up rugs, but that's something that I automatically do. And in fact, in one of these pictures, you see a gentleman doing just that. So I ask him and usually plan to putting it in a closet, whether it comes out again, I will never know. But um, anyway, rugs are an issue. If rugs must be on the floor, some people, again, are fastidious about that. Make sure that they are have a rubber back on them. They're not going to move when you kick them or step on them, and they won't get caught on a, a walker. Um, again, we see a walker here. Now, this walker is probably one of the most dangerous walkers. The reason why is because it has little tiny uh, three-inch wheels that get caught in absolutely everything. So not only are her front wheels not going to probably go over this rug if it wasn't picked up, but those tennis balls in the back have to go. Those are, we don't allow tennis balls in our store. They're replaced by skis which are, they look like skis. They're little nylon skis that go on the back of a walker instead of tennis balls because tennis balls are for your, your dog and hitting over a net. Those are the two purposes of tennis balls. So anyway, we replace them with skis which slide along all the surfaces in the home. So if we fix this walker, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put five inch wheels that go nicely over thresholds and, and when you're outside over cracks in the sidewalk and things and replace the tennis balls with skis. Therefore, if she does have rugs that are not picked up, they'll glide nicely over them and won't get caught. Um, it looks a little bit high for her as she has a lot of bend in her elbow. Um, technically, it's about 10 to 15 degrees. She looks more like she has about 30. And if you notice her, I'm picking on her, but this is a really good example. Look how high her shoulders are. If she had her walker at a lower height, her shoulders would be relaxed. Now, if you look at that, that illustrates perfectly my point about adjusting um, equipment properly. Reduce clutter. Um, clutter is a tripping hazard, and one single piece of paper on the floor acts like a skating rink, so be careful. Um, lift chairs and, and transfers are really important. Um, transfers have to be done very carefully, obviously, to keep the person um, from falling. But um, lift chairs can be helpful as well, and these are chairs that actually help lift the person out of the chair and can help them grab their, um, their equipment if they're using it or a handheld um, to transfer to different places. They also recline fully, so people do sleep in them if they need to. Okay, so the bedroom. Now, the bedroom is a room where they're going to spend a lot of their time. So we want to make sure that they're comfortable. Um, if they do have a weak side, we want to position the bed so that they can get in and out on the strong side and make it easier so they can be more comfortable. If they're struggling to get in and out of bed, it's just one more frustration that they really don't need. Um, they may need a hospital bed, and elevating the head of the bed puts them at a semi-sitting um, position, so it can really, really help the person to get out. The other thing are bed rails. Um, if you have a hospital bed, the hospital beds come with it, and um, but you can get bed rails that slip underneath the mattress, and um, and then they go at the level between the shoulders and the head. And um, and then they can have a handhold to go in and out of, of the bed. It makes it easier. And also think about, again, the uh, lack of perception with uh, boundaries, corners, and edges and things. So you may want to consider a smaller bed to create some boundaries. And rails are often necessary. And they're also low beds. Um, and low beds can be put to about 9.5 inches from the floor plus the mattress. And then a floor mat can be put on the side of that. So it creates a very so um, soft place should they fall, but hopefully they won't. But it creates a, another safe environment, so it's nice. Now, mirrors can be an issue as people lose that perceptual ability to recognize faces. They may be frightened by their own image because they're not recognizing their own face. And so they may think that there's a stranger in the room with them. 
So you may want to turn around or remove mirrors. I don't really like covering mirrors because I think it looks like a haunted house. So either remove or um, just remove them, I think is probably the best thing. And then lighting and shadows, again, that perceptual ability with a, a or perceptual um, misinterpretation with shadows looking can either look like holes or another person in the room. So just be cog cognizant of that. Lighting and lamps, again, is very important. Sunlight, natural light is best. There's an alt light that is a lamp. There are um, light bulbs these days that mimic natural light. It is easiest on the eyes, fewer shadows, less glare, and um, less likely to cause issues with your client. Okay, so mobility we spoke a little bit about with the assisted uh, assistive devices. Um, but again, just emphasizing to clear the pathways. I like this picture of this bedroom just because it's it's functional. It has everything that the person could need, um, but it's not overdone, so it's not overwhelming. Um, later stages, the plant could be misinterpreted as something, so that may be, need to be removed. But generally, a general idea of a basic bedroom, I like this because it's not too cluttered has bare floors, so it's easy to walk on, no rugs to trip on, which is nice. For dressing, dressing may become an issue, especially in later stages, and people don't like to change out of their clothes. So if you consider two sets of clothes of the identical clothing, um, that can help with those issues as well. And then one of the best um, things that I have heard is late close out in the order that they go on the body. And so, for instance, the underwear and the bra would be on top of the shirt and the pants. And so this client doesn't have to think about those sequencing abilities, which can become impaired, especially later on. They can just go ahead and dress as they would without having to choose. All right, so the bathroom can be a scary and stressful experience as we talked about earlier. Pre-planning helps, so have the towels, the warm towels that just came out of the dryer ready, the clothes set out, and, um, and then so you have everything ready. Now, this bathroom has a couple of things in it of assisted devices. Um, the first I love is a transfer bench, and this sits half in the tub, half out of the tub. This one is a plain one where the person would sit on the outside, move their feet into the tub, and then scoot over on their own volition. We also have ones that have seats that you can sit in that slide over, and then we also have the next step, which is a seat that swivels and slides. So the seat will meet you at the proper place to sit down, you swivel it to face the, the shower, and then you slide in. So you have some options there. Um, we can also get higher feet for these. So if, um, if somebody needs uh, has a high tub, we can accommodate that too. And so this is a nice, easy way to avoid somebody having to step over that dangerous tub which can be an issue in a, in a tripping fall hazard. Um, there is a handheld tub bar here, um, which is a possibility for somebody that still has the mobility to step over safely. However, I do prefer the tub bench to that. Um, anytime we can avoid stepping over that, that ledge is, is um, better. And then the other thing we have is a raised toilet seat, and there are tons of options of these. This one is a basic one that has handles, and um, the person, it rises up, so it raises a person up, so they can get on and off the toilet easier. You all know about commodes. There are things that you can sit under this, under your seat, so you can use your own seat. So many options. Um, and um, again, the key is this is a very nice bathroom, it's relaxing, um, and the, the key is to create a relaxing environment. Okay, so, so we have a video I want you guys to see. Um, it's with Tepper Snow, and it's on bathing, and I want you to watch it. I think it's amazing. And let me see if I can pull it up here. On the, are you right-handed? Yeah. 
I need to be on the dominant side of the individual because that's where they have motor memory for doing all kinds of tasks. They don't know how to use their other hand nearly as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get on this side. Now, hold hands like you normally hold hands. Shake hands like you normally shake hands. Go ahead and shake somebody's hand. And realize there's nothing real comfortable about that. I mean, once you shake hands, then it's like, okay, let go. And what we can end up with is a tug of war. Or late in the disease, people with dementia often like a lot of contact, and they'll squeeze you and actually hurt you, and it's like, ow, 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 get, and where are you going to grab to get them loose? On the wrist, and what you're going to do is bruise them again. Shake hands, but then immediately slide up around so that what you're doing is holding on palm to palm, thumb to thumb, and you've got a lot of palm contact. Try that with your partner. And then turn it so their hand is on top of yours and just relax the hand so that it's very clear it's relaxed. What you're doing is you're putting pressure in the palm and pressure in a human being's palm calms them down. So what you're actually doing is helping to calm them even while we're doing things because I'm giving them input into the sensory system. Okay? The other thing that I can do is take the other hand and lay it on top of the hand. And what I'm creating is artificial warmth and padding. What are they missing? Warmth and padding. So all of a sudden we're feeling more comfortable. Now there's a big difference between me being down here where she can see me, because remember the visual field problems? Mm -hmm. What happens if I'm up here? I, can't, I just see the yeah, and what if I face her like this? The, what she's going to start to do is mess with me here, or she doesn't realize what I'm doing, and it feels to her like I'm bossing her around. So I want to either sit down or get down so I'm at her level, and she can really look at me. The other thing I can do by applying just a little bit of pressure, she'll automatically look, and now I can talk to her. I'm going to help you get washed up. Okay. 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 Good. Listen, let's take your shirt off. Mm -hmm. There you go. Now, that's a little less distressing because she understood what I was doing by being to the side and having a single person in the room. And I'm not being loud. I'm not being noisy. What else do you think we need to think about doing in the room, given that she doesn't have any insulation and I'm about to have her come out of her shirt? Get it really warm. Who's going to need to be sweating? Me. I need to be hot so that when she comes out of her shirt, she's not uncomfortable. Because if she is uncomfortable, is she going to want to take more clothing off? No, because she's cold. Here's the next thing we're going to do. I'm going to take a warm towel fresh out of the dryer and drape it around her shoulders. Now, when I do that, what happens to her exposure in the front? She's covered. She's modest, but what can also happen, she's warmer. Then what I can do is wet her through the towel. I don't even need to take the bra or the under things off yet. I let her keep some modesty because once you get your clothing wet, what do you think most people want to do? Take it, take it off. And if I haven't had a battle up to now, now it makes sense to take those off. Okay. Here's the other place I want to put a towel. Across the lap. Why? That's the other modest place. And that's another place that's real sensitive. So, all right. So here we have a completely adapted bathroom. Now, what did you guys think of that video? I thought that was fabulous. The fact that um, putting pressure in the palm is a really good thing to know. And I was watching it, and I've seen this video a lot of times, and I've been trying to think about how to describe the, the palm to palm pressure and how relaxing it is. Think about walking with your significant other. What do you do? Hold hands. How do you hold hands? You hold hands palm to palm because it's natural, right? It's comfortable. You love the person. You want to hold their hand. And it's just what we do. It's just how we hold hands. So having that contact with the person is, is bonding and very calming. So I just, I really think that that, that, that video is invaluable. 
So let's look at about a really adapted bathroom. And this is probably one of, um, this is the perfect bathroom. If you could make a bathroom with somebody with memory loss or any kind of physical or neurological um, issue, we have a toilet that's uh, raised up at a nice height. We have grab bars present. We have, this looks to be a pole. Um, and then we have this grab bar here that can come down um, when they're sitting in the seat. So if they're sitting in the seat, they have a handheld. But to get to the seat, they have this out of the way. And so this is really, it's a great setup. Handheld shower, uh, non-slip um, tiles. Um, and then the other thing is just adding a mat down here, which this looks like it may be, and then there are more grab bars. So there's plenty of grab bars, plenty of space to move around. Um, it is not confining, it's all white, so it's not, um, the only thing that I could say about this is that there's no contrast. So the person would need some help maybe navigating because again, missing corners and edges, this may, might seem a little um, cavernous to the person. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention are bidets. And bidets, we all know, are, pro, are um, par for the course in Europe. Uh, they're making a comeback or making their way here. Um, but they are a wonderfully modest and dignified way to get clean. And again, this is something that if it is introduced in the early stages, um, can become memory and become par for the course in the later stages. And so it can save a lot of um, anguish, I believe, and um, really promote dignity. And dignity, as we all know, is um, what we're all trying to do, is to preserve that. Okay, so, so the kitchen. The kitchen um, is an area where we want to obviously be as safe as possible, sharp objects, fire, things like that. And so we, there are limiters on burners. You can make them so they only go up to maybe a medium height, a medium heat. And um, we could do the plastic knives and things like that. There are lettuce knives that don't have that really sharp edge, but they're big enough. They look like a regular knife for chopping. Um, I am big involving the person in any kind of cooking activity to their limitation, whether it's stirring or putting together items for a recipe, um, if they are able to chop or shred lettuce, anything like that is really great. And then, and the other thing that is really useful and can be used actually throughout the home, um, but especially for eating, is tableware. And this red tableware, as you can see, increases food intake by 25% and liquid intake by 80 So one of the issues um, that we all see in people with memory loss is the fact that they do not eat. And so, and I think part of that is because they lose their taste. And so things don't taste as much as they should. Or normally, like for us, we do have that intact sense. And so if you're losing that sense and everything tastes the same, um, who really would want to eat a lot? So if we can do anything to increase their food intake, it is, it's our duty and our job to do that. And I think it's really important. And liquid intake by 80%, um, wow. So we can prevent dehydration and issues associated with that. And then a little bit about liquid. Um, water is the hardest thing to swallow. So if you're working with somebody and eating and they <clears throat> start to cough and they're drinking, consider what they're drinking. Like I said, water is the thinnest. It's the most difficult thing to swallow. If you notice that they're coughing with water, try something thicker. Try something like maybe milk or even a juice. And then Kern's Nectars, which are available in any market, um, are actually nectar thick. And so there are different grades of thicknesses of liquid. And nectar thick is the first grade of liquid when you start thickening liquids. And Kern's nectars are nectar thick, so you can give them 
they're in any flavor of the rainbow. So if a person has a favorite fruit, chances are there's a there's a nectar of that favorite fruit. So I think it's really important. Food is life, as we all know. Um, I'm of the belief that food is love. And um, I cook for my family um, because I love them and I want to nourish them. And, you know, it's my gift to them. And so I think if we can take another view of how things are presented, uh, people do eat with their eyes eyes, make things visually appealing, use spices, um, and um, with a little creativity, I think that we can really, really help these folks get their intake that they need. Okay, so we have another video, and this video is a fire suppression and simplest device ever. I think that um, everybody should have one of these, honestly. and it's done. Um, what a great little thing. So let's talk about the kitchen. And um, labels are great. I'm an occupational therapist and have been working in the, um, in the hospitals. And I am one for leaving notes. So labeling things, making things easy to see, contrast, timers, pictures, notes, they're all useful. And you can be pretty creative with how you um, how you indicate notes and, and pictures and such. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the smart home. Now, um, smart homes are coming into being with the technology available to us, um, and they can run the gamut. So they can be something simple as just a camera situation. They can be as complex as you are able to interact with your person at home from a remote location. You can control the temperature, you can control the lighting, and you can control door locks all remotely. And so it is just, it's a gamut of whatever you wanna do, but um, it's technology that is available. Um, we have things like door exit alarms and things like that, that are, um, are basic safety issue or basic safety um, equipment. And then you can go all the way up to auto shut, auto off, auto shut off items and um, indicators. So it really depends on your preference as far as how smart of a home you want. Wandering is a big issue. And um, it is, pro I've heard that it's not a matter of if it'll happen, it's a matter of when. And so you can take some precautions. You see a doorway that's disguised as a bookcase, that helps. Um, keys placed away from the door, so re removing visual cues of it's time to go. And also keeping aware that activities around the time that the person would typically wander, and usually this becomes a significant with sundowning, um, perhaps in their previous life, it was time to go pick up a child and or go to work. Um, I know that um, 
that I was in a facility once and there was a doctor that had obviously been used to his whole life getting up, getting dressed and going out. Well, every morning at the facility, he got up, got dressed and tried to go out. And um, obviously he was in a, well, he was in a locked facility, so he couldn't, but he was there ready to help his patients. Um, another story was of a person that every evening she would pack her bag to go and um, every night the caregiver would unpack the bag and every evening it would get repacked and so it all helps helps to look at the person's life look what they were doing pre previously and intervene appropriately so consider some safety devices with this um, safe return gps tracking safe return is a uh, as you all know, it's Alzheimer's um, provides this. Um, they've got a great track record with, um, with returning people to their loved ones. A buddy system where somebody calls in at a certain amount of a certain interval or every day, so you know the person is, is home and safe is great. Or just making aware, uh, uh, neighbors aware to watch the person. The other thing we have is called a smart soul. And the smart soul sticks in their shoe, and then it has a GPS tracking device, and you can track them live time, so you can see step by step where they go, or you can get alerts every 10 minutes, and so that's a very useful item as well. Looks like it's our third poll question. Okay, again, we're going to ask everybody to weigh in quickly. Um, there are strategies that can reduce wandering behaviors among people with dementia. Is that true or false? There are strategies that can help to reduce or prevent wandering amongst people with dementia. Okay, hopefully everyone has weighed in and we can take a look at those results. Okay, great job, everybody. It's true that we just learned about some strategies that can reduce uh, wandering behaviors amongst people with dementia. Excellent. Okay, back to you, Leslie. Thank you. Okay, so let's look at the agitation and searching behaviors. And again, I think that a lot of agitation can be stopped or eliminated with activity. And um, I am just one that, I guess it's because of my background of being a therapist, but I am one that I figure, sorry guys, I figure that there's always something that you can do. So be it mimicking their previous occupations. For, for instance, uh, I had a student that was in a memory care facility and there was somebody that was very, very agitated, distracted, fidgety, and um, he found out that she had been a seamstress and um, in her working life. And so he got a magazine and he put it in front of her. And then he began to show her how to flip through it and tear pages. And um, it was an activity that she could relate to looking through um, books and with patterns and things. And she began to tear pages and flip through the book and fold pages, similarly to what she had been doing in her previous occupation. And so if you're just a little bit creative, um, you can do a fidget board, you can do a lap board, you can do, uh, material. There's so many things that you can make to help um, occupy a person. And I think that that is really critical. Hidden locks so they don't feel like they're locked out of things. And again, that goes with the dignity. And the lock up here is the magnetic lock. I love this lock because it's hidden. They don't know that they're being locked out of somewhere. But all you do is you, when it's closed, you use this device on the outside, it breaks the magne magnetism and you can open it. So simple, so easy. And then um, stop signs, visual cues of stop. We don't want you out here or going in the store or what have you um, is a visual stop. I prefer an alarm just because sometimes they can be a little bit foreboding. 
and um, have a place that it's safe for them to fidget. They can put, when my kids were little, it was the Tupperware drawer, and they could make as big of a mess as they wanted for as long as they wanted. Kept them occupied, they were safe, they were happy. So have a safe drawer, somewhere where they can go that has activities, that has things that are appropriate that they're going to like to do, that are going to make them feel um, more comfortable. So I appreciate all of you guys coming and listening to me. Um, these are some resources. Adapt to it is my store. Um, you see my phone number up there. I also have a store in Costa Mesa. And um, you guys are welcome to call me anytime. And um, there are also some other great resources. Obviously, the Alzheimer's store is a plethora of information and resources. This Caring Home is a great website um, put together by some university students. And then the Council on Aging, I lean heavily on them when I need advice or resources. Um, they also have enormous um, amount of resources available for um, the community and for caregivers in general. Oh, Leslie, I was taking notes uh, furiously during your whole presentation. It was so <laughs> Thank helpful. You. And we have reached the uh, point in the webinar for questions and answers. And so as a reminder to those of you who are seeking CE credit, you are not able to leave the webinar until you have been online for a total of 60 minutes. Uh, and so uh, I encourage you to stay for the question and answer period. And I'm just taking a look in the question box and we've got a couple of interesting questions for you. Um, okay. The first one is someone wants to know, how can you tell uh, when it's no longer safe? for a person with memory loss to live alone? Like say you have, you know, those gadget, you know, your mm -hmm. uh, safety adaptations and all that. How do you know how long they can continue to live there? Uh, that is an amazing question. Okay, so there are some signs that you can look for. Um, the first is cleanliness. Um, the first indication that there are things awry probably would be personal cleanliness. And so somebody that has, um, up until the point um, that you're noticing something different, been, you know, clean, well put together, clothes, you know, kept um, ironed or, you know, presentable, and then they begin to show signs that maybe they're not caring for themselves as well. The other things, I mean, the more obvious things are losing weight. So check the refrigerator, make sure that there's food in the refrigerator, that they are eating, um, or if there's just spoiled food and, you know, old milk in there, then you know that can be an indication as well. And then um, a lot of times what happens is people will make excuses for, um, for their issue. You know, oh, I've just been too tired. Or, you know, oh, you know, I had Jane over last night and I couldn't clean up. So those are all indications of, of times when it's maybe time to step in. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. Um, a comment from one of our participants had to do with dryer sheets, how they mm -hmm. can um, escape to the floor and can pr produce a slipping hazard. Have yes. you ever... Yeah, is that something that you've heard other people say as well? Um, no, but you're right. That is such a good point because those little those little suckers are slippery, <laughs> and <laughs> a lot of times they um, they're on towels. And so yeah. as you shake a towel out, yes, they can be on the ground. So definitely keep that is such that is really great. Yeah, I'm glad yeah. glad they brought that up. Okay, good. And then. Um, Oh, here's a challenging question. Um, one of our attendees wants to know, what do you do if your relative with memory loss has guns in the home? Ooh, um, I would remove them without them knowing. Okay. Um, um, they, they may or may not remember um, that they have them in there. 
Um, if it was a huge part of their life, they may remember. Um, the, the, probably the better answer is make sure that the guns are in a gun safe and that the, um, and change the, um, change the, the combination to get in there. Yep, that sounds good. And I mean, if if they refuse to let you remove them, you could maybe take the ammunition out, right? Just, yes, exactly. Or disarm yeah, them in some way. But you yes. know, this does come up a lot. You'd be surprised when uh, you know you were talking about past occupations. You know, and people uh -huh. have been in law enforcement or the military. Uh, and people feel strongly, you know, about keeping guns in the home one way or another. So that was a good question. Let's see Great. if we have anything else. We do. Um, and I, th this one got asked, and I think you actually addressed it, but let's reemphasize, Leslie, if you would, when the, when's the best time to make home modifications? Should we wait until the person with dementia progresses? to the point at which they need these modifications or should we do them earlier? No, um, proactivity is key. So okay. um, if you have somebody that has the propensity to become, you know, a person with memory loss, definitely the earlier the better. The earlier that they're introduced, the more comfortable they'll be with them. Good. Um, here's another question. Please explain again the importance of consistency or following the same routine in a oh, route, I'm sorry, following the same route in the home. Does this apply to adhering to a schedule as well? Okay, so let me reframe that again. Uh, so the, the, the attendee is saying, you talked about how they should follow the same route you know, yes. when they're walking in yes. the home, uh -huh. should they also have a consistent schedule is the question. Um, the route, definitely, because I think that that's, again, what I was talking about with mem with uh, muscle memory. And then later stages, if they've taken that route a thousand times, chances are they're going to know the way to the kitchen. Um, as far as a schedule, I'm not a scheduled person. And so um, I know that some people are, and so I would think that that would be more of a kind of a give and take between caregiver and client. Um, some people do very well with schedules, some people do not. However, somebody with memory loss, I would think a general schedule would be helpful just because they can anticipate what's coming next. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Leslie, we get that question a lot, and it's it's sort of hard to answer. On one hand, people with dementia do well when they have, you know, kind of a familiar routine. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we don't want people to, you know, eliminate spontaneity from their lives. So and th I think and that's it's good it. to have kind of a structure, but to be flexible with that right. structure. Right. And besides, we also know that sometimes we as caregivers have an agenda, but it's not right. always the same agenda that the person has. So, and that's yeah. and that's what it is. Yeah, it's a yeah. definite give and take. It's almost like a dance where you know you have to mm -hmm. look at the moment and see what's appropriate at that moment. And then mm -hmm. the other thing, people with memory loss, their day, I mean, their abilities can change hour to hour, day to day. Mm -hmm. And, and exactly. what worked yesterday may not work today. Yeah, always need to be flexible. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions. And just again, a reminder for everyone, if you did in fact log on at 1130 sharp, then you are able to leave the webinar at this point. But of course, we encourage you uh, to stick around just for a couple more minutes because these questions are, are very valuable, I think, information for all of us. So um, one of our uh, attendees wants to know if home modifications are covered by insurance. What a great question. <laughs> yeah, I get that all the time. Unfortunately, yeah. they are not. Yeah. I kind of suspected this that yeah. as well. I mean, it's something to do, it's something to think about. Um, you know, I think people maybe 
are starting to think about this a little bit earlier on in life. And I know mm -hmm. one person who's even got a save a special savings account just for home modifications because Smart. it's something that people don't plan for, but we often need. So right. um, I think Medicare might pay for some of the assisted assistive devices. Is that right, Leslie? Um, they pay for some mobility devices and sometimes mm -hmm. beds, but that's a whole other webinar. <laughs> Okay, we'll have to have you back. All right, <laughs> do you or do you have someone who will come and do a home assessment on items needed for the home? Yes, me. That's the next question. <laughs> me, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, myself and Steve, who is an aging in place specialist, and then okay. the other owner, um, Butch, who's a mechanical engineer, we powwow okay. um, constantly and assess homes and modify. Yes, we can do okay, that. Okay, so people would just call the number they're seeing on their screen now, adapt yeah. to it? Uh -huh. Okay, fantastic. I think we have one more question. Um, if, client, if the client is fearful and becomes agitated with the water and bathing, how do you wash their hair? Um, there is a shampoo cap. And that you can put in the microwave that becomes nice and warm and then you put it on you squish the you squish it squish it squish it around and then take it off and then towel dry the hair and it's clean it dries on its wow. own and it's beautiful works wonders mm, that sounds really helpful <laughs> yeah okay yeah. so that as unless I'm overlooking something that I think is the last question and that brings us to the end of our webinar. I just want to thank our speaker, um, Leslie, uh, again. She just gave us some fabulous information. And so we thank you, Leslie. We're grateful for your time and for sharing your expertise. And of course, we're also grateful to our partners, uh, O'Connor Mortuary, uh, Alzheimer's Orange County, and care choices uh, without the partnership we wouldn't be able to present this ongoing free monthly webinar so um, next month we have uh, a topic of create a safe environment for transgender individuals so i think that will be something that we can all learn a lot from and so we're hoping to see you back with us on tuesday september 11th at 11.30 a.m. Again, before we end the webinar, watch for the, um, the evaluation and please complete it within five days if you would like CE credit for today's webinar. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about our out upcoming webinars and other you know, educational op opportunities and events, just go to our website at www dot a l z o c dot org and then um, i believe our technician is sending the link out for the videos some of you experience difficulty seeing the videos so um, those links are going to be sent out to you as well um, let's see i think i have them here let me put them in the chat box for everyone. Oops. Okay. All right. Um, I think all of you got them. If you didn't, we'll send them to you. Thank you again, Leslie, and thank you all for joining You're us welcome. and have, have a great day. Thank you. Bye bye.